You're probably looking at the title of this video and thinking, wait, what box office? And yes, this was certainly a different year when it comes to measuring film studio successes and failures. For many films released in 2020, it will be a question mark for a long time. I even considered whether I should even do a box office rundown. However, as the pandemic raged on, I noticed each major studio seemed to react differently to this health crisis and the shuttering of cinemas. So in addition to talking about how their few films that receive a theatrical release performed, I will talk about their unique strategies. This is not going to be in any specific order, so I'm going to begin with the studio that's normally the big dog at the box office, Disney. They learned the hard way about the pandemic's effect on the box office when they opened onward in early March. The film had a decent opening weekend, then dropped dramatically in week two as cases rose and cinemagoers grew worried about the health risks. And then cinemas closed. The international performance was similarly tepid, making Onward the lowest grossing Pixar film at that point, but it will always have an asterisk attached to that stat. What did Disney do with the rest of their 2020 slate? They still retained faith in theatrical exhibition as they delayed the releases of Ryan the Last Dragon, Jungle Cruise, Peter Jackson's Beatles documentary Get Back, and Marvel's Black Widow and Eternals to 2021. However, they also took advantage of their new streaming service Disney Plus, as Artemis Fowl, the one and only Ivan, and Soul were shifted there. Although Soul still retained a theatrical release in a few countries, and especially seems to be striking a chord in China. Hamilton, meanwhile, got an earlier release than initially planned. It was originally set to open in cinemas this year, but with Broadway and other stage performances closed for the foreseeable future, the producers allowed the film version of the hit musical to go on Disney Plus over the summer, and Hamilton reportedly became one of the most watched movies on the platform, hopefully paving the way for more officially released pro shots. Then there was the curious case of Mulan. The decision was made to release it on Disney Plus, but with an added premium price of $30. How many people decided to pay the additional cost to stream Mulan? Well, it's hard to know, because there are so many conflicting reports. Some say it was very successful, while other news outlets provided less positive numbers. Ryan the Last Dragon will have a similar premium option on Disney Plus day and date with its theatrical release, so Disney must have seen something good with the numbers. One place where Mulan definitely did not leave an impact, though, was China. Disney expected the film to do enormous business in the Middle Kingdom, but the audience there rejected it. In addition to movies under the Disney and Marvel labels, the Mouse House also had a lot of 20th Century Studios releases to juggle. Earlier in the year, they opened the horror film Underwater, which made little impact at the box office. Then came Chris Sanders' adaptation of The Call of the Wild, which did better than many expected. It apparently resonated mostly with older viewers rather than the expected family audience, probably due to their familiarity with the classic Jack London story. However, the budget made it a challenge for Call of the Wild to make its money back. Due to agreements made with HBO prior to Disney's purchase of 20th Century Fox, they could not simply put the studio's films on Disney+. Plus. So The King's Man, Bob's Burgers the Movie, Free Guy, Deep Water, Death on the Nile, Everybody's Talking About Jamie, Ridley Scott's The Last Duel, and Steven Spielberg's West Side Story all shifted to 2021. That shows some confidence in those titles, as opposed to the few films they quietly released when cinemas open up again. The long delay, New Mutants finally opened during a pandemic, which felt like the final salt in the wound for maybe the unluckiest superhero film in recent memory. Not many people showed up either. At least its fate was better than The Empty Man, a film which Disney had so little faith in they only started marketing it a week before its release. Finally, The Woman in the Window and the Fear Street trilogy were sold to Netflix, a sentence you'll hear a few times in this video. Universal Pictures proved to be a major disruptor and seemed to lay down ideas that will forever change theatrical distribution. This game-changing year did get off to an interesting start, though. 1917's wide release did extremely well, thanks to its awards buzz and critical acclaim. And on the other end was Doolittle, which was mocked by critics. Even though The Doctor did a lot better than expected, it was not able to overcome the massive budget. The Turning and the Photograph were released with little fanfare, although The Invisible Man became another profitable hit for the Blumhouse label, and launched a new monster universe that might actually stick this time. 
Less lucky for Blumhouse was The Hunt, which was not able to profit off its pre-release controversy because it opened just before everything shut down. Like the other studios, Universal delayed a bunch of films to 2021, with Fast and Furious 9, Minions The Rise of Gru, the science fiction film Bios, the romantic comedy Marry Me, and the horror sequels Candyman, Forever Purge, and Halloween Kills all moving. Also worth noting is that Universal is the international distributor for the James Bond film No Time to Die, which itself has been delayed a few times. Some 2020 films stuck around, though. Most infamously was Trolls World Tour, which Universal took the radical approach of releasing as a premium video-on-demand title, and it reportedly did very well, inspiring a whole movement of theatrical films shifting to VOD. Universal themselves gave The King of Staten Island and You Should Have Left a similar release strategy. Then they struck a shocking deal with cinema chains that allowed them to make films available at home only a few weeks following their theatrical debuts. Freaky, All My Life, and News of the World all participate in this, although the standout performer has been The Crude's A New Age, which did better than I would have thought considering the current state of cinemas, and even though it is now available on VOD, there are still people seeing it on the big screen, proving both can coexist. Warner Brothers handled their massive schedule in their own way. Birds of Prey seemed like it would be another successful DC film based on a popular character. Instead, it only did okay. Would have probably helped if they picked a consistent title before release, and one that did not relegate Harley Quinn to the subtitle. Then there was the sports drama The Way Back, which was not in cinemas long enough to attract a sizable audience. As expected, a bunch of WB releases were moved to 2021, with Tom and Jerry, Judas and the Black Messiah, The Many Saints of Newark, Godzilla vs. Kong, The Conjuring 3, In the Heights, Dune, King Richard, and Malignant all doing so. WB tried different things for what they ended up keeping in 2020. For example, Scoob was given a premium VOD release, and Robert Zemeckis' adaptation of The Witches launched on HBO Max. And then there was Tenet. Despite everyone telling him it was a bad idea, Christopher Nolan insisted that the film open so cinemas could have something to show. And considering the circumstances, it did not do too badly, but Warner Brothers certainly lost money on the espionage action film. With Wonder Woman 1984, WB decided to put the blockbuster superhero sequel simultaneously in cinemas and on HBO Max, the start of a new experiment they're trying. So at least people have the option of seeing it safely at home, although more people than I predicted opted to still see the film in cinemas. And WW84 has apparently done its job of bringing more subscribers to HBO Max. So we'll see if this strategy pays off for the studio, even if they've greatly annoyed most of their talent with the announcement that everything on their 2021 slate will follow Wonder Woman's example. Of the major Hollywood studios dealing with the current world crisis, I think Sony handled it the smartest. Their year started off with a bang thanks to the sequel Bad Boys for Life. With its over $200 million domestic gross, it is the highest grossing film in North America of 2020. It was also probably the only film that was not majorly affected by the pandemic. Sony also released a new entry in the Grudge series and Blumhouse's Fancy Island, which did respectable business. The action film Bloodshot's theatrical performance was cut short less than a week into its run, although I've read the VOD numbers have been solid, which was enough to start development on a sequel. While other studios retained some optimism that things would return to normal by the end of the year, Sony was less confident and moved almost everything they had to 2021. Peter Rabbit 2, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Morbius, Venom 2, The Man from Toronto, Fatherhood, Escape Room 2, The Nightingale, and eventually Connected all made the move. And in retrospect, this was probably the right choice on Sony's part. Some of their titles did get home releases, though. The Craft Legacy got a VOD release, while Greyhound was sold to Apple TV+, An American Pickle went to HBO Max, and Happiest Season became a big hit for Hulu. Sony supplied some films to theaters, though mainly independent films they picked up or movies they had little financial stake in and were primarily distributors on. The Broken Hearts Gallery, The Last Shift, The Kid Detective, The Last Vermeer, and Yellow Rose received theatrical releases, although only Broken Hearts Gallery got any kind of significant publicity. There was also Paul W.S. Anson's Monster Hunter, which was largely overshadowed by the film being quickly pulled in China for an inappropriate joke that somehow made its way into the movie. As for Paramount, the highlight of their year came from a speedy blue hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog turned out quite the Cinderella story, going from a dismissed design to a box office hit. The Blue Blur also gave Paramount a much-needed new franchise. 
Before Sonic, Paramount also released Like a Boss and The Rhythm Section, neither of which did particularly well. When the pandemic happened, the studio actually delayed only a small handful of films into the next year. A Quiet Place 2 and Top Gun Maverick were the most publicized. But the action film Infinite, the science fiction movie The Tomorrow War, the family film Clifford the Big Red Dog, the G.I. Joe movie Snake Eyes, and the comedy sequel Jackass 4 will also move to 2021. They did release a few films on VOD, with Body Cam, Love of Monsters, and Spell. There's also the strange strategy given to the Spongebob movie Sponge on the Run. It opened in Canadian cinemas in August, went to Netflix and other territories in November, and will get a straight-to-VOD release in the United States in February. Just why? Paramount completely sold The Lovebirds and The Trial of Chicago 7 to Netflix, while the Coming to America sequel went to Amazon for $125 million. Paramount will still handle international distribution for that film, though. So as you can see, Hollywood had to think quickly on its feet with how to handle the wrench thrown into their usual operations, and I cannot imagine the stress the studio chiefs are under. Here's hoping this nightmare of a pandemic ends soon, but I think it's clear film distribution is never going to be the same. I would like to know in the comments which major studio you think made the best and smartest choices in 2020, and I'll see you next time.